Good afternoon and welcome to the final webinar of Let's Talk Poetry Series 2. My name is Rebecca Tierney and I'm the Poetry Advisor within Chagas. Today's speaker is Michelle Burke, Senior Nutritionist with Devonish. Michelle is going to talk to us today in relation to poultry nutrition and a bit on protein sustainability. So Michelle graduated from UCD uh, with an honours degree in agriculture, specialising in animal production in 1991. Uh, she did some time in the UK as a poultry nutritionist before returning home to do a stint with Chagas uh, in Condolton College. She moved then to Ravini in Dublin and looked after pig and poultry production there and nutrition. Uh, she then took a break from the industry to run her own business in something totally different, uh, interior design, definitely a, a world away from the poultry. Uh, but she came back to all things feathers and joined Devonish Nutrition as a senior poultry nutritionist. So Devonish uh, Nutrition is an agricultural solutions company manufacturing and supplying premixes to the animal feed industry, along with providing bespoke technical and nutritional support to its customers, uh, be they either processors, feed mills or on the ground farmers. I want to thank you all today uh, for your attendance and indeed the rest of the series up to date. We have been delighted with the attendance and the interaction from you, our producers, and that's testament to your willingness to learn and progress our industry even further in these difficult times as we face the, the ongoing issue of avian influenza. So I want to draw your attention to the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen and I want you to send in any questions you may have for Michelle um, and we'll address those at the end of the, today's session. Uh, today's webinar is recorded and will be available at the end um, of today, with, along with Michelle's presentation. So Michelle, I'll ask you to, to share your screen and we'll begin with your presentation, please. Hi, Rebecca. <clears throat> Thanks for the introduction and thank you to Chagas for inviting me today to speak to you with regards to poultry nutrition. Um, Clearly, this is something that I could talk about for five weeks or five days. Um, it's such a broad and vast concept with regards to nutrition of all the different types of poultry species. Um, but I've only got about 40 minutes, so I'm going to do the best I can. I have to say it is rather strange being here looking at a screen of myself um, in that you guys can all see me and I can't see you. So some of you guys that are logged on, I may know. Um, some of you may know me, whether that's uh, I've been calling to your businesses or whether I've been speaking to you on the phone or indeed whether I've actually visited you on farm. So it's nice to meet you virtually um, and it's nice hopefully to meet you again in the flesh in the future. Um, I'm going to just share my screen now. Hopefully this will work. I work for Devonish Nutrition, as Rebecca just uh, briefly mentioned. We are a premix vitamin mineral manufacturing company, and we also manufacture um, and provide nutritional solutions to the global agricultural industry, if you like. Um, we have probably an annual turnover now of about approaching 200 million sterling per year, and we have about 750 employees around the world, of which I am one. So today I'm going to share a little bit um, with you about what I do on a day to day basis and how we are going to try and maximize the nutrition of our ever increasing and ever demanding uh, poultry species. So hopefully technology will not let me down. And we'll be able to get started. Here we go. OK, hopefully everybody can see that screen. Yep, we're seeing that perfectly. Uh, okay, great. I just get you to change the display settings just there at the top. Um, see it there. Um, just just up the very top there. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, display settings up the top there. Yeah. Yeah, and then uh, just just a uh, swap presenter view and slideshow. That's it. So now you can just see there that. Oh, we're yep, yeah, we're good to go. Yep, yeah, good to go. Great. Okay, so the topic of my talk today is um, poultry nutrition, time to take stock. Um, obviously, you know, there's a number of different species within poultry, so I'm trying to go and, going to try and cover, you know, a number of different species. I don't want to spe specifically cover anyone, be it broilers or pullet layers or turkeys or whatever it may be. So I want to talk about nutrition in general to the avian species. And the title is Time to Take Stock because very much uh, what I want to, to discuss is the time we're very much involved in, in, in time. Time is critical at the moment in terms of what we do with our poultry um, and it's ever decreasing. Um, the time we have to get things right in poultry nutrition is ever decreasing as the bird, uh, the age of the bird that gets to market um, it becomes shorter and shorter. So what we have within Devonish is a concept that we call One Health from Soil to Society. 
And basically what this means is that we're, we're you know, we start from our producer who's producing our crops uh, from the soil that we're given, be it in this country or other raw materials com coming from other countries. And um, those obviously then are formulated into feeds, which are fed to our chickens, our turkeys, our broilers, our egg layers, whatever it may be, through to the processor, onto the shelf uh, of the retailer and through to our consumer, which is ultimately you and me and everybody else. Um, so what we're very cognizant of is that our consumer uh, is the health of our consumer, really, is what we're, we're trying to is what we're all doing. It's the business that we're all in, whether we're farmers or whether we're poultry nutritionists or whatever it is. The ultimate uh, goal is to keep our consumer healthy and um, well fed um, in a very safe and sustainable manner. Um, and we also need to do that within a very healthy environment. So we need to look after the planet that we're living on, as well as looking after the people that are living on that planet. And some of the steps obviously within this process um, are the nutrient optimization of each of these steps. And that's a little bit about what I'm going to be talking about today. So there was uh, somebody very famous once said that time and tide wait for nobody. Um, and I think this is very true. We're now dealing with a poultry species that is getting to market an awful lot younger than it used to. So the time that we have to get the nutrients right and to get the diets correct, to get the optimum performance from our bird is ever decreasing. Nowadays, you know, we're getting broilers um, to factories 31, 32 days, whereas a couple of years ago, it was considerably longer than that. So the, the amount of time that we have to optimize the nutrient package that we have to give to the bird to optimize the performance is ever decreasing. And I want, I want to talk about nutrition really, about what we're doing now in the present, um, always cognizant of what we've done in the past, but very much looking towards the future in terms of, well, what should we be doing? Um, what are we doing now that's right? What are we doing now that's wrong? What should we be doing in the future that can improve the performance of our bird, that can improve and maintain the welfare of our bird? and that can optimize the profitability to everybody um, along that process chain that I was showing you earlier on. So we'll be looking towards the future and it's always nice, this is part, part of my daily job is to try and predict what's coming down the line, try and predict before other people predicted what we're gonna be looking at uh, in the future in terms of diets, uh, in terms of raw materials, in terms of the progeny and the genetics of the birds that we're dealing with um, and how we need to bespoke present our nutritional package to each of those future um, options coming our way. What I want to show you next is a little video and it's a really nice, I love this video because it, it really demonstrates the whole theme of what I'm talking about today, which is time. And within this video, you'll come to understand and, you, and you'll see what I'm talking about in that how much happens to our bird in such a short period of time and how we only really have a tiny fraction of an amount of time to get things right so that when things go wrong, they really can go wrong. So just let's hopefully this video will work and um, technology won't let us down and I'll see what you think um, when it's over. Thank you. 
hopefully everybody um, could see what it, I meant by the amount of, I think it's, I love that video because besides it makes me all feel all warm and fluffy inside and very maternal. I think it actually is a fabulous demonstration of the development of what happens from when we go from this tiny little embryo um, right through to a 21 um, day old embryo chick uh, or a day old chick that lands on your farm. The amount of development that actually takes place for something that actually doesn't receive any feed for 21 days is quite staggering. Um, and this is really important to me um, and it's one of the projects that I've been working on over the years in terms of how we can improve the performance of this progeny inside in the egg for 21 days. And if you think about it in 2020, the embryo at the moment, if you look at the, the lifespan of our broiler that's getting to factory at 31, 31 33 days, um, 21 days of, of that, of the embryo of the broiler's life, 21 days in the egg plus another 32 days growing represents about 39% of the actual lifespan of the broiler from day minus 21 through to day 32 kill. If we go ahead to another 10 years, 2030, which, you know, seems like a long way, away, away, but it really isn't that far away. We will then be looking at um, the broiler spending about 44% of its life in the embryo as the kill age decreases. So as the time that it takes for the broiler to get to factory, you know, we'll probably be killing at day 28, 27, maybe in 10 years time. Our broiler is going to be approaching about 50% of its total lifespan inside in the egg. Well, that is actually quite staggering. So what's really important is how do we feed this embryo? So how do we feed mom? How do we feed our breeders to ensure that our progeny, that our day old chick that lands on the farm is the best that it can be? So we have to always look backwards to look forwards. And I find some of this work um, really fascinating. It's something that Devon, she's heavily involved in at the moment in terms of looking to see how we can feed our breeder better to improve our progeny uh, day old performance. So looking at nu nutrition, it's never in isolation. Um, it's never just one thing that, that can fix all. It's never just all about the diet. It's all about a number of different things that take part in this wheel. Clearly veterinary support and the veterinary issue, help that you have on farm is a huge part of the whole package. The measurement is critical. And I always say, if you don't measure, we can't improve. So if we're not measuring what we're doing on a daily basis, if we're not measuring our performance, if we're not measuring our inputs, we can't improve on those. And if we're not being compliant with what we should be doing, then we can't improve our performance. Bird management clearly has a huge part to play in nutrition, and I'll be talking a lot more about that throughout the uh, presentation. But what happens on the ground, on the farm, from a daily, on a daily basis, has a massive impact on how good the nutrient package that the birds have been fed is going to be in terms of egg, breast meat yield, carcass weight performance. And alternative strategies then can play a big part and ever more so now what we see these uh, whole implication of slow growing broilers, organic broilers, free range birds, free range eggs, different strategies, both in terms of production strategies and in terms of additives uh, and alternative strategies uh, that can be used within the diet. So it's never just one piece of the jigsaw, as you all very well know, um, it's a number of different things that go to make the wheels turn properly. In particular, then, if you look at this, genetics is also a huge part of this. And I've been you know, talking about that briefly with regards to the video. Our birds are getting ever younger um, to get to market. On the opposite side of the scale, with regards to our laying hens, our birds are getting ever more older uh, to lay more eggs. We're now looking at birds that are well uh, capable of laying um, eggs well into the 100 weeks or so from a commercial table egg point of view. So the genetics of the bird is ever changing and the birds that we used to feed 10 years ago uh, when I was in business, when you've all been in business, are not the same as the birds that we're feeding now. So all these factors, um, raw materials that we're using, I mean, I'm constantly monitoring raw materials with all the feed mills that I work with um, to make sure that we're getting the optimum diet, the environment that the birds are living in, all of these things are part of getting the most, squeezing the most out of the diet that we're being fed. And that's basically what we need to try and do. Uh, we need to squeeze the most that we can out of the package of nutrients that we're feeding our birds. So the, the, op the objects of nutrition really are to supply a balanced, um, a range of balanced diets and balanced is the key word here. Um, and this is what I try to do on a, on a daily basis is to make sure that the diets are balanced, that we haven't got too much or too little of anything. 
um, that we need to satisfy the nutrient requirements of all poultry at all stages of their development and production. So a broiler that's two days old is very clearly different to a broiler that's 20 days old and they need very different nutritional objectives, as does a 20 week old pullet um, compared to a 55 week old pullet. Um, so we're trying to optimize efficiency all the time, but always thinking about profitability too. Everybody needs to make money, but always having at the back of our mind uh, that the welfare of the bird is not being compromised. And this evermore is becoming part and parcel of our daily objective is to ensure that the welfare of our birds is um, being maximized. As we know, Feed is 60 to 70% of the total costs of poultry production. You probably don't need me to remind you of that. Um, ever, so, ever more so now, um, you know, we're, we, we're probably facing some very, very tough times coming ahead in the next few months with regards to we're all, we're all in the middle of COVID, that's not helping us. We're all in the middle of a Brexit scenario, that's not helping us. We're now currently in the middle of an AI storm um, and have been for the last number of months, but in particularly in the last number of days. Uh, that's not helping us with our export markets. And what also isn't helping us is that raw material prices globally are increasing. Um, that's not helping us. That's not going to help our feed costs. Uh, there's major issues at the moment with uh, logistics and supply of raw materials coming from China, and particularly some of the amino acids. I'll be talking about those later. Um, if the pig uh, heard coming back on stream in China um, following the African swine fever um, decimation of their industry really the pig herd are starting to come back on stream in China and obviously the numbers there are not insignificant and they are taking up a lot of the supply of some of the world's raw materials which means that the rest of the raw materials left for the rest of the world is, 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 is typical economics isn't it supply and demand so unfortunately we're in a situation where raw material costs are rising and uh, actually obtaining raw materials and getting containers um, across from China is a very big issue, particularly for us at the moment. And we know we're, we're, we're having daily battles, trying to make sure the containers uh, are on the water for us um, in time for our customers. Um, so as I said, we're always trying to get the correct balance of nutrients for optimum growth and performance. And that's what I try to do every day. Um, clearly we can't give one diet for one farm. Um, each feed mill has to do the best they can to give the best, uh, bespoke diet for the types of genetics of birds that we're dealing with at the moment. So as to make sure that, you know, I do monthly diets with mills all the time to make sure that we're uh, balancing the diet to give the optimum growth and performance from the birds. But, you know, the management factors on farm uh, can mitigate some of the potential benefits that can come from those feeds. So, you know, management factors can alter our feed intake, our live weight gain and our FCR. So we always have to try and make sure that those are being maximized and optimized as well so that you can squeeze the most out of your package of nutrients. And remember, it's the daily feed intake of nutrients that matters. It's not what's on the ticket. It's not what's on the label. Um, it's how much the bird actually takes in per day of the nutrients that is what's gonna make it grow and lay eggs. So back to my time uh, theme again, if you look at a broiler growth curve, um, and again, this is a little bit old, um, but if you look at it from taking it from naught to 42 days, the blue line is the growth of the bird. And we can see that in the first um, seven days or so, there's a rapid development of the gut. So all the gut integrity, not all of it, but a very large part of the gut integrity takes place in the first seven days. And a huge part of it takes place in the minus 21 days in the embryo, in, in the egg. Within this time, then you also got a huge development of skeleton and bone mineralization. So it's really important to get early feed intake. And we, you know, we're always talking about early feed intake, early crop fill. Thereafter, then we're looking at feather growth, uh, protein deposition later on. Um, and then the older the bird gets, the fattier it gets. We all know that. Um, so we're trying to get to our kill where we get the best carcass uh, confirmation and the best breast meat yield. So our diets are designed with these, with these growth uh, particulars in mind. Likewise, with our pullet um, for our laying hen, the first six weeks are all about uh, getting the intestine correct, getting the intestine set up, getting the immune system uh, up and running, get the integument of the gut correct. Um, thereafter then we're into the skeletal structure of our layer, which is so critically important, looking at the cortical bone. Um, sort of post 10, 12 weeks then we start to, you know, the, the body starts to look at the reproductive organs, developing those in terms of looking at muscle mass, and in particular the medullary bone for the calcium uh, reserves that she'll need when she's laying an egg every day. 
Um, and then obviously looking at muscle fat and um, muscle mass uh, to fat uh, ratios uh, for confirmation and correct transfer weight so that she's going to lay as many eggs as she genetically can. So all these different phases need different types of diets and different types of targeted nutrition to achieve everything that's going on in the body at the, at the time. Just talking about early intake, um, if you look at the blue graph, the blue bars along here, and you'll see the numbers at the bottom, 12, 18, 24, 30, these are hours of fasting. So clearly nobody wants to have a, a, a day old broiler chick fasting for 30 hours. But what I'm trying to show here is that the longer the period of fasting, the lower is your seven day weight. So your seven day weights at 100%. If you go to 30, 30 hours fasting, which you know went for chicks that have been um, exported abroad, this can be a very common occurrence. This has a big impact on your seven day weight um, in terms of fasting. It also has a big correlation to your final kill weight. Now you could swap that to 42 days to 33, 34 days. What happens at seven days, and indeed now what happens at four days really, has a very large correlation to your final kill weight, provided all of the things obviously are equal. There are areas where you can catch up. But a lot of people talk about seven day weight, it's really four to five day weight now. And it's not just about, I, some of you may have heard me harping on about this before. It's not just about weight, it's about strength. I talk about the seven day strength of broilers because it's not, it's not always about the weight of hitting 200 grams or 205 grams or whatever at seven days. It's about the strength of that bird and the integrity, integrity of their gut and how ready and capable they are to run with the diets that you've got and to put on the maximum weight that they can. So this demonstrates really, you can see these little villi here, which are these, loop, these loops. Um, so these are like, you know, I'm sure all of you are very familiar with mop, mopping the floor. And if you look at a mop, you'll see that they all have these long tendrils on them. The reason that a mop has these long tendrils on, on them is because it actually maximizes the surface area of the mop to pick up as much dirt as possible off the floor. Well, the same thing happens in the villi of, of our birds. The more of these villi that we have, the longer that they are, the deeper that these crypts of lubricant are, which are the, the, the valleys in between um, these villi, the better it is from a nutrient absorption point of view, because you have more surface area for the nutrients to actually be absorbed. Without these, you can see if you've got a very flat sort of undeveloped uh, gut integrity, you very little surface area for the nutrients to get absorbed and they just pass right through. So what, always we're, what we're trying to do is make sure that our day old bird, um, has as much of an established villi as possible and early crop fill and early very early very good starter diets will help uh, to bring these villi on um, in terms of length and strength but also what happens to the bird in the embryo can be quite dramatically altered by how how we can help feed our breeder and our hen um, and our mom in terms of trying to improve um, the establishment of the villi within our bird and the, the more the better and you can actually see just in this little video here um, how the nutrients are passing through so you can see how they get latched onto the villi the longer they are because there's more surface area whereas if there is no long villi they just get rushed through and it's a complete and utter waste and um, so this is something that we all you know we're trying to cater for in our very early uh, young chick nutrition so just want to talk a little bit about water because uh, everybody gets, you know, very head up on nutrients and what's in feed and this, that and the other, but water is so important. And I call it my two to one rule. Now, it's not quite two to one because we, we all know that, you know, our ratios of water should be in the air in the range of about 1.7, uh, 1.8 is to one. But just for simplicity's sake, let's take it two to one. So a bird, bird basically drinks about two times more water um, than it actually eats. Um, but we get very hung up on what it's eating and sometimes we forget about the importance of the water. It has to be available 24 hours a day. And trust me, I've been to farms where there's been issues with performance and the whole drinker line has been turned off um, for some strange reason. So water is really critical uh, because water will control your feed intake. Um, if you don't have enough water or if you don't have, if you have too much water, you're gonna get reduced performance because there's a very close relationship between feed and water intake. If the quality of the water is poor, if there's a high bacterial load, if you've got high minerals, if the temperature is wrong, if the hardness or the pH um, is wrong for the bird, um, then you can run into problems. So look, you'll have all have been in this situation, growers will have been in this situation where sudden increases or decreases in water 
in the ratio or in the demand uh, can upset the bird and, and you know, can cause scouring or wet litter. And these can be due to environmental stress, whether it's environment in the house. Um, you know, we've had very, very hot summers in the last couple of years. We're having a very unusual winter at the moment because it's so mild. Um, you know, disease status will have a big impact on the water intake of the bird and variation in feed quality can have a big impact. Uh, grist size within your feed delivered, if you get a load of dusty feed, if you get a load, a load of hard uh, pellets or hard crumbs, um, this can have a big impact on the water um, that the bird actually takes as well. So it's just not to forget that water plays a very large uh, role in nutrition and you know most of the time it's really free or almost free so we should be paying a little bit more attention to it this is a bit of a complicated example but i just uh, the reason i'm giving it to, i want to go through it is because it just goes to show the importance of a very small package of nutrients and the impact that it can have on our birds so if we take our two kilo bird it generally it's about three kilos 3.2 kilos of feed depending on how good your fcrs are um, at a 12% moisture content, then the bird is actually consuming about 2.4 kilograms of feed on a dry matter basis. And anybody who makes silage will be very familiar with the whole dry matter concept. So if we look at our two kilo bird, two kilo of weight, about 65% of that is moisture. And um, if we take away the feces, the urine, our carbon dioxide, the skeleton, we actually only have about 720 grams of actual body weight on a bird on a dry matter basis. It's consuming about between four and six kilos of water. So for every one kilogram of feed consumed, it only delivers about 0.24 kilos or about 240 grams of body weight. So only 24% of the feed consumed that we give to our broiler is converted to actual body weight. So it's critical that we get that 24% right and that it's very well balanced because it's such a tiny amount and the rest gets wasted. So what we're trying to do is minimize the waste to maximize our dry matter body gain. So just getting on to some of the diets now um, and in diets we have the nutrients which are I'm going to chat about which would be en our energies, our oils, our proteins, amino acids, uh, fibre is becoming very more important, minerals and vitamins and the, nut the nutrients basically come from um, a whole mix of different ingredients um, which you'll all be familiar with, with uh, in terms of wheat, high pro soya, rapeseed meal, distiller's meal, sunflower meal, um, high pro soya obviously from, from a protein point of view some of the oils, soy oils, um, maize, and then the premixes and enzymes. So I'm just going to talk a little bit through some of these um, in terms of what they do and why they're important. So we just look at energy first, and energy is probably one of the most expensive components of a diet. Um, the main sources of energy are coming from our cereals, from a carbohydrate uh, form, so our wheat and our maize, um, and also from our vegetable oils, so our soy oils, and some of the oil seeds if we're using a whole oil seed rate. And the role of energy really is very much in, in regards to metabolism. Uh, so the general metabolism of a bird, the organ development, and also maintenance and growth. So birds eat to energy, basically. So if, if they have enough energy, um, what happens when they eat to energy is that the energy gets partitioned. So within the bird, it'll eat so much energy and the energy will get partitioned. Some of the energy gets partitioned off for maintenance. So just literally being able to survive. And whatever energy is left over then goes towards growth or goes towards laying eggs or goes towards, you know, hatching an egg every day uh, or, you know, laying eggs from a breeder point of view for, for progeny. So we have to make sure that we balance our energy, that there's enough left over to give us the production from the birds that we need um, under normal maintenance conditions. Under supplying your energy, you're going to see body weight decreases. That's fairly obvious. Um, and the birds will try to compensate by eating more. So that's when we see our FCRs going off um, because they do tend to eat to energy. If we oversupply the energy, we give them too much. They only need X amount for maintenance um, and they only need X amount for the genetic potential of the production that they can actually uh, do. So that's laying down muscle or laying eggs. And then we might get into a scouring issue if we have an excess of energy because it has to, the bird has to get rid of it somewhere. So it's, it's a very fine line to make sure that the energy is balanced um, and the bird is actually eating the energy requirements that it needs per day. Some of you will be familiar then with the concept of enzymes. Enzymes were just one of the best things that ever happened to the animal feed industry back 30 years ago. Uh, prior to that, we didn't really use enzymes. So basically what 
you know, every growing animal has enzymes, including ourselves. We all have enzymes inside our body and the enzymes break down a lot of the feed when we digest our feed. But sometimes uh, the bird doesn't have enough um, or doesn't have the right quantity of the enzyme it needs or the enzymes, their own natural enzymes can be bolstered or boosted by enzymes, very natural forms of enzymes that we can add to the diet. And this is very commonplace now because a lot of nutrients are bound within the vegetable part of the diet. And some of these can be quite indigestible. They're not readily available to the bird, but they're very valuable. Um, particularly inside in the fibrous fractions of wheat and maize and barley in particular, uh, we're looking at the non-starch polysaccharides or the NSPs. And then we also have phosphorus, which is in the form of a phytate phosphorus. Uh, bound inside in cereals and phosphorus is very expensive and we need phosphorus uh, for lots of things but in particular also for legs uh, so what we do now is that we formulate in enzymes into the diet that basically break apart all these bonds within the feed once the feed is digested within in the animal and allow um, these hidden or trapped nutrients um, inside in the feed to be available to the bird. So they really are, you know, they've been a gold dust in terms of um, maximizing. And, and it's like I was talking about before, getting the maximum that we can out of our diet for the least cost. That's what this is all about. So yeah, so enzymes have become very commonplace um, and you'll all be familiar with those. And, you know, they've really helped in terms of improving the digestibility of diets as well. Protein, I want to talk, obviously, is extremely important um, in the diet. Protein is what, you know, really dominates and will have a big impact on our egg production, our, our egg supply, and on our meat uh, deposition uh, on the carcass. And the main sources of protein that are used in, in the diets that uh, we're all using every day are high per soya, and you'll be very familiar with that, with rapeseed. Quite a bit of rape is grown in Ireland. Um, uh, DDGS, which is distillers grains, a uh, byproduct of uh, maize or, or corn, uh, sunflower is used to a certain degree, and then obviously amino synthetic amino acids. So the role of proteins that basically supply amino acids at a cellular level for body maintenance and also for growth and breast muscle development. Um, an undersupply, we're going to see reduced growth basically. Uh, so when a bird is genetically formed it has these myofibrils which form part of the muscle um, and so they're basically all like little tendrils if you can imagine all little fingers or, or, or back to even our mop all of those are myofibrils within a muscle and um, now whilst we can't control uh, and at a nutritional level the amount of myofibrils that are laid down within the muscle that's the job of the genetics what we can control in nutrition is how fat we can make those myofibrils and by fat i don't mean fatty i mean how dense how big can we um, increase those myofibrils to lay down more muscle tissue? And that's the job of amino acids. Uh, amino acids are also very heavily involved in feathering. So if we get the wrong uh, poor feathering, there's usually some issues with uh, methionine or methionine and cysteine. Um, so an undersupply can have serious effects, um, but as can an oversupply. And very often in nutrition, I come across this every day, you know, that people look at diet labels and they look at, oh, look at that lysine. There's more lysine in that diet than there is in that diet. Just because there's more doesn't mean that it's better. It's about the balance. Um, and sometimes an oversupply, and particularly of things in, of an oversupply of protein and amino acids, can be quite dangerous to the bird because it causes a lot of them a lot of stress because they have to deaminate that protein. And to deaminate the protein it takes up a lot of energy. And we were talking about the cost of energy earlier on. So if they're using the energy to break down protein they don't need um, into urea and ureic acid and ultimately ammonia, then that energy has been used somewhere else instead of laying down breast muscle or instead of laying, uh, laying eggs. So too much of something can also be a bad thing. Um, so we, we can create metabolic stresses um, and an energy imbalance, as we're talking about. Uh, poor growth if, if you have an oversupply because the bird is too busy trying to get rid of what it doesn't need. Um, what it also happens is if you've got too much protein, you can feed the bad bacteria in the gut. And they, trust me, Clostridia loves too much protein um, and Clostridia is not good. So what we want to avoid is uh, the bad bacteria because we all know that leads to scouring and wet litter. So again, it's a balance. It's a fine balance. I want to talk a little bit about soya. Uh, it's hot on, on everybody's you know, topic at the moment in regards to nutrition and the use of sustainable soya. Um, 
soybeans, uh, you know, have a very big part in our diets in poultry. They usually can take anywhere between, depending on the species, from 15 up to 25, 27% of our diet. So it's a, a big chunk of our diet, maybe a quarter of our diet comes from soya. So how sustainable is, is that soya? So you can see that poultry, um, for every average, roughly every kilo of product of poultry meat or mass of eggs, we use about 882 grams of soya. For pigs, it's about a quarter of that, so only about 263 grams of soya. And for ruminants, it's even less, be it beef or milk, it's about 173 grams. So we, in the poultry industry, are huge consumers of soya, which is why it's such a hot topic at the moment. 80% of the soya that we use comes from the United States, Brazil and Argentina. Um, and as we're all very aware now, how sustainable is the soya that we're actually using? Well, in many cases, um, it's not. Um, there's a lot of discussion at the moment now about uh, trying to look for more sustainable um, options on soya. Uh, because the Chinese pig market has come back on stream, um, you know, there's a huge demand on soya now and soya prices are, are going through the roof at the moment um, because there aren't a huge amount of alternatives for soya to be used at 25% of the diet. Soy is a beautiful product for poultry. They love it and it's highly digestible um, and has a fantastic array of amino acids um, in, it, in it as a raw material. Um, so what we're trying to do now is look at alternatives, um, but we're also trying to look at um, soya that's sustainable. You can see some of the damage that's been done in the Brazilian Cerrado, where you're looking at um, you know, complete depletion of some of the natural resources in the land, the deforestation uh, in some areas of uh, South America and even in Iowa, where there's huge um, soya and, and, and wheat um, growing areas. We're looking at soil erosion gullies as well. So, you know, this mass produced, mass farmed raw material that we all need, you know, is having an impact on our planet. Um, and I'll be talking about soya again in a minute but just wanted to look at the carbon footprint by species as well because this is all something that's becoming extremely important to our supermarkets at the moment and um, you know the consumer one is concerned about carbon footprint the consume the supermarkets are concerned about the carbon footprint of some of the foods that they have on the shelf and you know that comes right back down the chain to the feed mill to the processor uh, to the farmer ultimately in terms of what are we doing to try and minimize our carbon footprint well we're in the fortunate position compared to other species that our poultry carbon footprint is considerably lower than the likes of sheep and beef and milk on airplanes, by the way. Um, if you look at eggs and poultry meat, you know, it is lower than all of those, but it's still always of concern. We do a lot, we're doing a lot of work now for customers where we're trying to track the carbon footprints of their diets. Uh, we're taking their diets and going back five years and uh, looking at the diets uh, currently uh, that they're using and trying to map diets that they might be using in the future to identify the carbon footprint reduction uh, to some of the supermarkets um, and it can be done it's not easy it's not straightforward and um, it's something that we have a couple of calculators and a couple of tools within our toolbox in Devonish to be able to do and uh, it's actually very interesting and it, I think we will be formulating to a carbon footprint without a doubt in the near future. So it's, it's quite, quite an interesting area. Ammonia then is something that's, you know, hot on everybody's lips at the moment. It's been a huge issue with the pig industry, um, as I'm sure lots of you are aware, from a planning permission point of view, poultry is catching up and catching up fast with regards to ammonia emissions. And if you look at the ammonia emissions from agriculture, um, on an EU basis, Ireland is about 98% um, of ammonia from agriculture, Northern Ireland about 91%, UK about 88%. Uh, so it's a very big issue. Um, there are guidelines, there are deadlines, there are you know, maximum limits that we have to adhere to. Um, and you know, the country as a whole is working on these. Again, Devonish is working on looking at um, products and diets that can try and minimise the ammonia emission from poultry. And again, it's a, it's a very interesting area that's going to be a hot topic over the next few years. So back to our nutrients in the diet. Um, some of the smaller elements that go into the diet then would be our macro minerals and then our calcium and phosphorus. So our main sources of calcium and phosphorus would be limestone, phosphates, and also from some cereals. Calcium and phosphorus, as we know, very important for bone strength and leg strength, um, but they're also really important within the, within the body for metabolism. 
they have a huge role to play in those enzymes I was talking about earlier on. Um, and if we have a depletion or don't have enough calcium and phosphorus, the bird says, great, I've got all the calcium and phosphorus I need to have lovely strong legs. Oh, flip it. I don't have enough calcium, you know, within my body to make this enzyme work so I can lay down extra protein uh, so body weight can suffer. So it's all about trying to get the balance as well, that it isn't all about legs and skeletons with calcium and phosphorus. It has a big impact to play in terms of nerves and muscle control as well. Under supply, you know, we know that it's going to give us soft bones, it's going to give us a poor gait, it's going to give us reduced mobility, you're going to get foot pad dermatitis um, if that's the case, and you're going to get poor growth. An oversupply can cause an issue too, like everything. As I said earlier, too much of, of something isn't always a good thing. Too much calcium can cause soaps. So what can actually happen is that the calcium will bind to some of the critical minerals within the body and form a soap, uh, which renders that mineral to, uh, unavailable to the bird and gets flushed out in the feces. So it's all about, you know, just because, you know, the ticket might say, oh, you've got, you know, 0.9% calcium or 1% calcium, your diet must be better than mine because it only has 0.8% calcium. That isn't always the case. So be very, very wary in terms of looking it's the balance, it's the ratio, it's the balance of making sure um, that we haven't got too much in the diet. And then down to the trace elements, and this is what we do. These, so these are the tiny little things that go into the diet that tend to be really, really expensive, um, particularly on the vitamin side of things. Um, so this is what we mix. Um, I, I, one of my standard poultry premixes could have anything up to 26, 27 ingredients in, all in tiny, tiny amounts. But each one of those is really critical that it goes in at the right level. And I'll be speaking a bit about that in a minute. Um, you know, between these trace elements of minerals and vitamins, they have huge roles to play in terms of supporting general health, um, immune function, catalytic function with regards to some of those enzymes I was talking about, metabolic processes within the body, just even looking after normal growth, um, electrolyte balance. I mean, there's just so many things that they get involved with. We could be here for the next two weeks looking at each one in, in individually. Manganese, zinc, iron, copper, cobalt, iodine, selenium, molybdenum, you would have heard of all of these. These are all very, very important, but all go in at very low additions. Like I'm talking like teaspoons, tiny, tiny amounts into a ton of feed, but every one of them has a very important role to play. And it's my job and our job at Devonish to make sure that these are all mixed up properly um, and uh, dispersed very pro properly within uh, the ton of feed that you get blown into your feed bin. Vitamins then, uh, again, usually come through the premix and they have a very important role to play as an antioxidant to break down any fat or rad free radicals that might be running around inside in the body because free fat running around inside in anybody, including our own, is never a good thing. Um, they get very much involved in the immune system and in metallic support, metabolic support, um, required again in very, very small amounts. Um, and, you know, have a big impact in terms of the bird is very stressed and sometimes the vitamins don't actually get utilized and absorbed properly within the body. Undersupply can lead to some problems, which I'll go through in a moment. Um, appetite issues, particularly in, with regards to disease resistance, bone deformity, deformities, feathering, um, skin abnormalities as well. So all those vitamins, the A, D3, vitamin E in particular for immunity, vitamin K, B1, B2, B6, B12, Niacin, pantothenic acid, biotin, they're all very involved in different processes within the body and all have a critical role to play. So what I want to talk about is that size doesn't matter. Um, if we're looking at our soya here, um, as I said earlier, soya, let's just take an average in, in a starter broiler diet, could be 25% of your, of your diet. So, so that's a huge, very important part of the ton of feed that um, actually gets delivered. Um, so we're looking at one in four of a ratio for soya. So it's really important that we have good quality soya that's highly digestible uh, to our bird. But equally important is the zinc. Um, and zinc is a trace element that we add in the premix. We only add about 80 grams per ton of feed, um, between 80 to 100, depending on the diet. Um, so about a couple of teaspoons worth in a ton of feed. But it's really, really important. It's just as important as the soya. So if you want to look at it in terms of a ratio, soy is one in four, the zinc is one in 12,500. 12, so it's tiny, but it's just as important. 
And then if you want to look at biotin, I know biotin is really important for skin integrity, for muscle, for feather integrity, for our foot pad dermatitis. Uh, we add that even in, in even tinier amounts. So I'm talking at like one teaspoon of biotin goes into a ton of feed. It's really tiny, but it's just so important. If it gets left out, you'll know about it. Um, so again, if we look at the ratios, we're looking at one in 40 million. So these are this, this is the scale of the size of the importance of the ingredients. You know, just because soy is going in at 25% doesn't mean that it's any more important than the biotin that's only going in at one teaspoon. So there's so many steps within the chain that we have to get right before that feed gets delivered out the door. This is the power of the analytical chemist. So basically, sometimes the analytical chemist, you know, if we're sending away feed for analysis, we could be getting down to one picogram in a gram of feed. And when we're sending away feed for analysis, we they, they only analyze about a gram of it in the, in the lab. So that's, that's like the chemist trying to find one second in 37,000 years. So, you know, what we're doing here is really, really specific and it's really bespoke. Um, and as I said, the time that we have, within our bird to get it right is ever decreasing. So some of the deficiencies, you know, that you'd, you'd be familiar with this, many of the vitamin three, D3 deficiency, we're looking at rubbery bones, we're looking at poor feathering, a B1 deficiency, you have loss of nervous control, you can have this concord splayed uh, position. A biotin deficiency, so remember the biotin was one in 40 million, so if I forget to put the biotin into my premix, you can get bad feet. Now this is quite a dramatic, uh, visualization of bad feet versus good feet. Uh, but that tiny, tiny teaspoonful, you know, just because it's a teaspoon, it's like, ah, should it be all right? If, you know, if it's not in, it won't be all right. And um, we have to make sure that everything that should be going in is going in at the correct levels, or otherwise you're going to have problems. Vitamin A deficiency, never really see this anymore, but you know, eyes and, and beak issues. Lysine deficiency, you get blanched feathers on colored birds, but you get a, basically you don't get any breast meat yield. Uh, very, it would be very unusual and very rare in our to have ly lysine deficiencies. Vitamin E and selenium deficiency. Vitamin E is heavily involved in uh, immunity within the bird. And I'm, I'm thankful to say that our diets in Ireland are really well spec for vitamin E. They're really good in terms of vitamin E levels. Um, and there's, a, there's some nice levels of vitamin E in there to compensate for some of the disease challenges that we can face, particularly over the next few months over the winter. Um, and it's involved in muscle integrity in, 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 along with selenium. Digestive scours, yeah, so we've all seen this. None of us wants to see this, um, but trust me, um, I've seen it. Um, we've all seen it, you know, this isn't what we want to see in our house with a frothy kind of foamy uh, dung. Um, number, obviously many different reasons for this uh, and why it can happen. And nutrition can for sure be one of them, but isn't always uh, the one that's at fault. So it's about getting that balance right. It's about making sure that our bird is disease free and our bird is happy basically so that it can use the energy to not have digestive scours and to grow. Coccidiosis, you know, could be a reason why the birds are scouring. It might be a pre there might be a preentative scouring with coxie coming behind. You often see blood in the feces and you can see the damage to the gut lining when you open them up and you, if you do uh, oozes scoring. Uh, the problem with coxie as well is that it can allow for secondary infection. So you can get the your clostridia coming in behind it saying, happy days, this bird isn't happy. I'm going to, you know, maximize this opportunity to invade the gut. Um, if the diet isn't balanced, then even better because you've got the bad bacteria. You might have too much protein in there and the bad bacteria will just thrive on that. Uh, nutrients won't get absorbed when the bird is sick like this because what's the bird doing is utilizing that energy to fight the disease and it's just not going to grow. Um, so you're going to have performance issues. It is easily controlled with the correct coccidios, coccidiostat program, um, which your vet um, and number of people can come out on farm and uh, coxie score to see um, what sort of resistance are you getting. And, you know, we design programs that change, change from summer to spring. And there's some super products out there which really can keep uh, coccidiosis at bay. Vaccinations, obviously, in, in America now, they're looking at um, coxie coccidiostat free diets where they have a, the term no antibiotics ever, NAE and ionophores as a coccidiostat are classed now as a antibiotic in the US and um, so they don't they aren't using them at all. Now obviously they're using a lot of vaccination um, and it's something that we are going to start seeing here, you know, there's been some success 
in commercial broilers, certainly in the north, and some success on some free range uh, sites at the moment. Um, and it is going to become part of our world, but like all COX vaccinations, um, including, as we all know at the moment, our COVID vaccination is getting hands on enough vaccinations for all the broilers that are grown in the world and all the turkeys, etc. Uh, to be able to roll this out on a large scale. So at the moment, it's not going to happen overnight, um, but it's certainly something that will be uh, down the line in the future. So we need to continuously review. We need to always be cognizant of the environmental changes that are going on, um, improved biosecurity, and uh, never more so than now, with AI looming everywhere. Um, you know, we have to be very careful in terms of who's coming in our gate, what's coming in our gate, what shouldn't be coming in the gate from a biosecurity point of view, because we do not want to challenge that bird. We do not want to challenge our industry with a disease that's um, going to knock us on the head. We're currently in that situation now at the moment. Uh, we need to keep the disease status of our flocks um, as low as possible, um, and management has a huge part to play in that. The genetic challenges that we're facing all the time, you know, the birds continually changing and my job is to keep up with the nutrient requirements of that changing bird. Um, and that's why the future, as we've been talking about throughout this uh, session, is so important in, trying to, in terms of trying to predict what's going on and looking at meat quality, you know, particularly in terms of myopathies, breast myopathies with um, wooden breast meat yield or spaghetti um, breast. We're always trying to look at how a diet can have an impact on improving those. Um, at the, but at the same time, not compromising our performance and our FCR. And again, alternative raw materials, you know, we're always trying to look at are there alternatives out there? Um, for some of the more expensive raw materials and, and you know raw materials are getting expensive at the moment in terms of uh, efficacy availability and cost um, cost clearly has a, a role to play in terms of the diet formulation but trust me with all the feedings i work with it's never the top line it's making sure that the steps of the stairs of the diet when we move from one diet from a starter diet to a grower diet or when we move from a rearing diet onto a pre-lay or a laying diet that the steps of those stairs are smooth and that we aren't putting our birds at risk because ultimately um, we all know that if the birds don't perform it comes straight back uh, straight back at the nutritionist so we're always looking at making sure that we have the right raw materials in the diet yes cost is important but it's not the domineering factor so in summary, nutrition and diet formulation is only a contributing factor to a successful bird performance. Um, so you can't take nutrition by itself, I think is, is basically what we're saying. Um, there are lots of other factors like farm management, our biosecurity we were talking about, the environment that the birds are in, the environment that we're sending our birds out into in terms of our planet, and the health of the birds and the veterinary input as well. They all impact on the nutritional requirements. Diet formulation of feed manufacturer is complex. It, it's really complex. Um, and you can, you can see there's 40, 50, 60 different you know, nutrients within that diet and each one of them is as important as the other. Um, so we always have to make sure that they're balanced and balanced properly um, for every aspect of the bird, of different types of birds and for every aspect of the production performance and age and stage that they're going through. Um, but it does need to be cost effective I'm very, and we're all very aware of that. So basically what we're trying to do is make sure that we don't put petrol into a diesel engine. And um, so I hope that's given you some indication of nutrition. It's, I know it's very broad. I could speak specifically about each um, species for hours and hours, but we're running out of time. <laughs> Sorry, Rebecca, did I talk for too long? <laughs> You're all right. Well, you're all right. Uh, I didn't want to interrupt a brilliant presentation like that. It would be hard to stop. I was on a flow. I was flowing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And we won't stall those types of things. Uh, thanks a million, Michelle, for taking the time to prepare that and to deliver it. Uh, lots of information there. Uh, just really highlights how important it is to make sure we give the birds the best opportunity to perform to the standards we're expecting of them. Um, uh, so I suppose you did mention that protein in particular is, is one that's been targeted for its sustainability. Um, what are the sustainable choices for, so, uh, for, for the likes of soya or what other protein sources will we be looking at into the future? Yeah, yeah, no, that's a good question. Um, look, the, the soya is an issue because we're trying to source sustainably and, you know, there are certain areas of soya production that are sustainable, but you have to pay the price. You have to, you can buy a sustainable certificate if you like. It's something that is going to become more commonplace, but ultimately at the moment when there's a cost, 
uh, you know, the supermarkets say, oh yeah, great, we want to have sustainable soya, but uh, hello, are you prepared to pay for it? Um, so there's always a trade-off um, at the moment. So it is an issue. It's an issue that we're very aware of. Soya is a huge part of our diet. There are other pro protein, you know, replacements that we can look at, like our grapeseed meal or sunflowers, but they can only be put in at a certain amount because of different fiber levels and anti-nutritive levels that they have. So we're always very careful not to overcook it. Um, in those diets because we still want to maximize performance and the digestibility of some of your other protein raw materials that we have aren't nearly as good as soya so we're trying to balance it there's other raw materials that are coming on stream like you might have heard of insect protein meal a lot of talk about this particularly in the middle east and in some other markets around the world um, yeah it's you know birds love worms birds love maggots so like that's what they, they they grow up doing you know over the thousands of years um whether there's going to be social implications um, with regards to some of those uh, feeding of those to our birds, I do worry uh, if the red top get hold of, oh my God, you know, humans are eating chickens that have been fed on worms, you know, so there's always those types of implications, even though it's the natural uh, diet for those birds. The, the, the production of them at the moment is on a very small scale um, and it's still being trialed, but we are absolutely, we're looking at it actively ourselves at the moment. We have to be very careful of the disease status of those worms and of those flies, um, you know, that we're looking at black, you know, black soldier fly, the larvae from those. But are we happy with the disease status of that fly at the moment? And there's some questions around that um, that we need that need answering. So yes, soya is on everybody's lips, but as of yet, as of tomorrow, we don't have a, a massive solution uh, from a sustainability point of view. But people are working on it. And when it's when it's a buzzword, you'll always find that there's going to be improvements. Yeah, definitely. Um, you mentioned the fact that the bird's life, particularly on broilers, is getting shorter and shorter. So how do we as producers maximise the feed that we give them and, and the benefit they can receive from that? Yeah, yeah. Um, look, this is something that, you know, we work with every day with feed mills to try and ensure that, you know, the starter diet that we might have today, uh, you know, is not the same as the starter diet that you were using five years ago. And if it is, it shouldn't be. Uh, diets are developing all the time, you know, amino acid ratios within the diets are developing all the time because we know now that we used to always talk about seven day weights. It's now four or five day weights that are really important um, because that proportion of time that the bird and, and we're even looking at, you know, feeding programs now because traditionally we've always kept the same feeding program for a bird that was being killed in 42 days. Feeding programs need to be altered now to the proportion of time that the bird um, is developing at different stages. So the starter diet is ever more important. Um, in terms of getting that early development. So optimizing nutrition as bespoke as we can for the general population of bird is what we're always trying to do. Cognizant of the fact that, you know, in five years time, we we're gonna be killing two days earlier than we are now, you know. So the proportion of time that the bird is on the finisher diet is gonna be much less if we continue with the same feeding programs. So we need to look at the proportions of different diets of different feeding programs and alter those accordingly. Okay, um, and just a question, another one, we'll finish with one final question, Michelle. Um, so what are the nutrients that affect the hatching quality? So what do we need to be ensuring that our breeders receive to make sure that we start off with a good, strong chick? Right, so there's, there's different nutrients for obviously for hatching the egg. Um, you know, we want to make sure that we have a good shell strength, you know, that we've got eggs that we can put into the setter to hatch. Um, but what ultimately we're looking at from our breeder is that it, that embryo is as strong as it can be so it can pip that shell um, to get out. So some of the, 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 there's so many, you know, but the energy that, that the breeder is, because breeders are, you know, they don't get as much feed as they want to get, you know, they can be quite restricted. You know, we have to restrict their weight, their feed because of their weight. And we have to make sure that the package of nutrients that they get in their 165 grams a day or whatever it is, um, is enough for mom but is enough to develop the, the embryo as well. Um, and looking at different transfer pathways of some of the nutrients that go into the egg. Some of the zinc, for instance, is, plays a huge part in the, you know, that villi, villi I was talking about in the, in the bird's integrity. So if we can feed really good, nice levels of zinc and a really good organic available zinc to, uh, to the young chick and perhaps to the mom, we can develop, uh, we can influence the gut integrity of our chick um, but one, making sure that the embryo has enough energy, has enough fat reserves in the yolk sac, basically. So making sure that we get enough transference of energy into the yolk sac so that that embryo can feed on the yolk sac, use, utilizes the yolk sac to have enough en energy to pip the shell and to come out as a really lively, bouncing around the place, stale chick. Um, yeah, that's what we're always trying to do. 
Fantastic. Michelle, thank you so much for joining me today. Um, look, I suppose we, we couldn't have today's webinar without mentioning the, the developing situation of AI. Um, I did attempt to contact the Department of Agricultural, Food and Marine. Um, understandably, they're, they're probably up to the eyes of the situation that's developing. So I just have um, the report from the National Disease Control Centre. Um, I'll give a little bit of an update from that, but I also did receive a, an update from the IFA, so I'll just go so a quick read out to, to update those that are on the call. So on the 10th of December 2020, DAFAM confirmed test results that identified avian influenza virus subtype H5N8 in samples from a small turkey flock in County Wicklow. Uh, further testing is being con uh, carried out to, to determine the pathogenicity of it, um, and we're awaiting the results of that. So the birds have been killed, and avian influenza restriction zones are in place. Um, additional protection and surveillance measures are being applied. Um, there's been a further five cases of, of HPAI virus subtype H5N8 in wild birds since they provided their last update. So that, that's 10 cases in total. Uh, so the importance of biosecurity really cannot be stressed enough. Um, and if there's any signs of any description, it applies to all flocks, irrespective of, of size. So that's from the Department of Agriculture, uh, but just coming from, from the IFA, so reacting to the confirmation of a highly pathogenic strain of AI subtype H5N8 uh, detected in a small flock of free-range turkeys in Wicklow, uh, IFA President Tim Cullinan urged poultry growers to remain particularly vigilant and maintain the highest levels of biosecurity on farm. We've had cases of avian influenza in the wild bird population since early November. All commercial poultry producers are on high alert and ensuring the highest standards of biosecurity are in place on farms, he said. This latest development means that Ireland is no longer free of AI in our national poultry flock. This presents significant difficulties to the poultry industry as Ireland has lost its certificate for export to many non-EU countries. Export of many poultry products such as high value duck and value added eggs to both Asian and Middle Eastern countries will be restricted as a result. South Africa is also an important export destination for poultry products and it will now be restricted. The Department of Agriculture told the poultry spokes, uh, so it's stakeholder meeting, that efforts are ongoing to get export markets such as Singapore, Hong Kong, Middle Eastern nations and South Africa to accept the EU regionalisation protocols and allow unrestricted market access from regions within Ireland not affected by AI to continue. Uh, IFA is calling on the government to make every effort at the highest diplomatic level to see that trade is allowed to continue. The latest development could disastrously compound the impact of a no-deal Brexit for the Irish poultry industry. The department has enforced a restriction zone of up to 10 kilometres around the farm in Wicklow, where additional protections and surveillance measures will be put in place. The movement of eggs, live birds and any animals on and off the holding the poultry will be under strict licence and controlled by DAFAM. Um, so that's, that's, uh, the restrictions are being put in place to protect Irish poultry um, flock and the poultry industry as a whole. Um, but very importantly, there's no food risk uh, associated with turkeys or any poultry products due to this case. So Chagas and indeed all poultry stakeholders are asking poultry growers and producers to ensure strict biosecurity measures. If you suspect AI, please contact your regional veterinary office immediately. And if any person finds an ill or dead wild bird, please do not touch it and again contact the local uh, veterinary office. Uh, so unfortunately with that we draw to a close our Let's Talk Poultry series. Michelle, thank you again for an excellent presentation and thank you for taking the time to be here today with us. I want to thank you, our producers, for your interaction and attendance throughout the series. To our industry players, integrators, egg packers, rearers, hatcheries, nutritional companies uh, and the Department of Agriculture, Food and Marine for your support on this series yet again. To all our speakers, Ethan White, Dr. Pat Wall, Kieran McCabe and Michelle, thank you for taking time to prepare and deliver your excellent presentations. The feedback has been excellent, uh, so thanks again for passing on a wealth of knowledge to us. Today's webinar and indeed all of our webinars have been recorded and are now available on the Chagas website. So that's all for me. Stay safe um, and a happy Christmas and New Year to everybody. Thank you, Rebecca. Thanks again, Michelle.